Welcome to Electrified. My name is Dylan Loomis, and in this episode, we're going to get into the detail of Tesla regulatory credits. Obviously, this has been a controversial topic over the last few years, but I'm bringing it up now because it could be a potential reason why Tesla's S&P 500 inclusion could be delayed. Major disclaimer, I'm not arguing that this is going to happen. I'm just stating the case of what a potential outcome may be. Either way, I think it's worth understanding these regulatory credits in depth as it will be a substantial part of Tesla's business for the next few years at a minimum. So because there's so much information that I found in my research, we're gonna get right into it. So starting with what these regulatory credits are, the California Air Resources Board or CARB manages this ZEV or Zero Emission Vehicle Program. However, it has also been adopted by 10 other states, Colorado, Connecticut, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Thus, by directly requiring that automakers invest in clean technology, the ZEV program is considered one of the nation's most forward-looking climate policies. Basically, the ZEV program assigns each automaker ZEV credits. Automakers are required to maintain ZEV credits equal to a set percentage of non-electric sales. Each car sold earns a number of credits based on the type of ZEV and its battery range. The credit requirement is 7% for 2019, which would require about 3% of sales to be ZEVs. I'll explain this discrepancy in a moment. This credit requirement is set to increase to 22% in 2025. This will be important in a moment. For an example, an automaker selling 100,000 cars in California in 2018 needed at least 7,000 ZEV credits, which I'll refer to as ZEV from here on out. However, this doesn't mean that they need to sell 7,000 electric cars and trucks to comply because most ZEVs generate more than one credit per vehicle sold. So basically these automakers can earn credits selling zero emission cars and trucks and the credit per vehicle does vary based upon the drivetrain and the electric range. From 2018 forward, plug-in hybrids, which only partially drive on electricity, receive between 0.4 and 1.3 credits per car sold. Battery electric and fuel cell vehicles, on the other hand, received between one and four credits based on the range. So essentially, if manufacturers don't sell enough non-polluting vehicles, they have to purchase credits from competitors like Tesla to make up this difference or their find. And historically, most of this opportunity for selling regulatory credits for Tesla has been in the US, but recently with more emission standards coming online in places like Europe, where Tesla is also going to continue to expand, this opportunity will be more global. Probably most notably, last April, FCA came out and said that they would pool their fleet with Tesla so that they could comply with EU standards. One thing that's tough about these ZEV credits is that there's a lack of transparency, which makes it difficult to predict how sales of these credits will affect Tesla's bottom line quarter to quarter. One of the reasons is because prices for the ZEV credits and GHG or greenhouse gas credits are not typically disclosed. Additionally, it is very important to note that these companies can actually bank these credits and sell them whenever they want, but historically, Elon has not been pleased with CARB saying on a 2016 conference call, quote, there were some quarters where we simply can't find a buyer for credits. And then when we do find a buyer, it's typically 50 cents on the dollar for the ZEV credit, end quote. These credit systems are in place both at the state level and the federal level. At the federal, you have the EPA and NHTSA who are actually running the programs. And so this is where we get into the huge debate. So all of the naysayers are claiming that these credits are not sustainable. And yes, to a degree, that's true. However, when we zoom out and look at the bigger picture, we need to remember that each year, these emissions requirements are going to be more and more strict. And as we've seen so far, no one outside of Tesla has successfully sold electric vehicles. It's going to be harder and harder to meet these regulations each year. So yes, I mean, in the long term, this isn't sustainable, but 
for the next three, five, perhaps even 10 years, Tesla could have a huge business from these regulatory credits. So the fact of the matter is that these credits won't go away for Tesla until either a regulation changes, which is unlikely, or two, these other automakers don't have to buy the credits from Tesla anymore. The only way that happens is if these automakers actually sell a high enough percentage of their fleet each year from ZEV vehicles versus the traditional ICE cars, which as we know is a huge task for them to overcome and no one has proven that they can do that just yet. Another thing I like about how Tesla has handled the situation, back around like 2015, there was a lot of controversy because Tesla was somewhat cagey and withholding when it came to these regulatory credit reporting figures. But in the last few years, Tesla has started to report this data and become more transparent. And I think real quick, it's important to remember, Tesla is not ultimately focused strictly on profitability, at least right now. Elon recently said, quote, we want to be profitable, but we want to be slightly profitable and maximize growth and make the cars as affordable as possible. That is what we are trying to achieve, end quote. So with a general overview of these regulatory credits out of the way, we need to talk about the S&P inclusion and why this may be an issue. As you probably know by now, because this has been covered ad nauseum, Tesla being included in the S&P 500, yes, is based on a set of criteria that technically they've hit. However, ultimately it is a board or a panel that is deciding what companies make it into the S&P. So it's not 100% criteria based. It is also a subjective decision based on these panel members' decisions. So the argument now becomes, well, because Tesla has such a high percentage of their profit coming from regulatory credits, this isn't sustainable and their core operations is not actually yet generating a profit, so they may still be too volatile for S&P inclusion. And honestly, guys, I mean, the argument is fairly reasonable. When you look at the regulatory credits for Tesla in quarter one, 2020, it was 354 million, quarter two, 2020, 428 million. So far in 2020, they have $782 million in regulatory credit sales. Now, when you compare that to their net income, in quarter one, it was 16 million, quarter two, it was 104 million. So if you do the simple math and you take out the regulatory credit sales, Tesla would not be generating a profit, at least in terms of the gap, the generally accepted accounting principles standards. So summing it up, looking at the first half of 2020, Tesla has $782 million of regulatory credit sales, contributing to only 120 million in gap net income. So this brings us into the debate, right? Now, obviously I would never argue that you should just take away these credits because Tesla should be rewarded for pioneering this industry and being the ones leading the way of the electric vehicle revolution, they should be rewarded. But it is a fact that without these regulatory credit sales, Tesla wouldn't yet be profitable. So once again, I'm not arguing that this should be the case. I'm just stating that this is the situation that we're in. But once again, it's like no one ever stipulated that Tesla or any company for that matter needed to have the four quarters of sequential profitability by any certain means. It never said any regulatory credit sales are not included. It's just, once again, it goes back to being a subjective thing for the S&P panel. And basically it's their risk tolerance. If they think Tesla is still too risky to be profitable consistently without regulatory credits, they may not be included just yet. Because one of the major questions that is going along with this is will Tesla being added to the S&P 500 increase the volatility too much over time? which has also led to the question of if the S&P panel should change the profitability requirements to avoid situations like this. And just so you guys know and have a frame of reference, in 2016, Tesla earned $302.3 million from regulatory credit sales. 2017, it went up to $360.3 million. 2018, went up again, $418.6 million. 2019, increased continually to $594 million. And so far in 2020, as we've said, they have $782 million through the first half of the year. Now, Zach Kirkhorn did say on a conference call recently that Tesla expects these credits to double in 2020, which would be $1.19 billion for the full year of 2020, which would mean another $408 million expected in the second half of 2020, 
which seems low, but guys, if we go back, you have to remember that they can sell these credits at any time so they can essentially store them and bank them. And one of the main questions becomes, do you consider these ZEV credits to be a product that Tesla is creating? It's very easy once again to make the argument for both sides, but I'm curious as to what you guys think if it should be a product or it should be something that we plan to be without here in the next few years. But ultimately, there's no reason for Tesla to be punished for operating its business in a way that anybody would do. Any other business on the planet in Tesla's position would maximize these regulatory credit sales exactly like they're doing. And Zach Kirkhorn also said recently, we don't manage the business with the assumption that regulatory credits will contribute significantly to the future, end quote. And real quick, I just want to read to you from Tesla directly in their 10K, which is basically just an annual financial performance report required by the SEC. From 2019, Tesla said, in connection with the production delivery placement into service and ongoing operation of our zero emission vehicles, charging infrastructure and solar systems in global markets, we have earned and will continue to earn various tradable regulatory credits. We have sold these credits and will continue to sell future credits to automotive companies and other regulated entities who can use the credits to comply with emission standards and other regulatory requirements. For example, under California Zero Emission Vehicle Regulation and those of states that have adopted California standard, vehicle manufacturers are required to earn or purchase credits, referred to as ZEV credits, for compliance with their annual regulatory requirements. These laws provide that automakers may bank or sell to other regulated parties their excess credits if they earn more credits than the minimum quantity required by those laws. Tesla also earns other types of saleable regulatory credits in the United States and abroad, including greenhouse gas, fuel economy, and clean fuel credits. Likewise, several US states have adopted procurement requirements for renewable energy production. These requirements enable companies deploying solar energy to earn tradable credits known as solar renewable energy credits. So, what do you guys think? If you were on the S&P 500 panel and you had to be completely objective, all Tesla fanhood investing aside, would you include Tesla into the S&P 500 given the regulatory credit situation? And honestly, I'm not just trying to sit on the fence here or be political. I can genuinely see and make arguments for both sides. And honestly, guys, personally, I think these regulatory credits will be a significant part of Tesla's revenue for at least the next few years. For the reasons mentioned, the emission standards will continue to be more strict, not only in the US, but globally as well. And none of these legacy automakers have shown any level of success in selling ZEVs. So as more and more pressure is put on these legacy automakers to meet these requirements, they will be forced to turn to Tesla unless some of them can start to produce the required number of electric vehicles. And as Tesla continues to expand globally, specifically in Europe, where these emission standards are now becoming more and more prevalent, that will be yet another market where Tesla has potential to have more ZEV sales. But as always guys, let me know what you think below. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Thank you for watching this long. I really appreciate it. Please like the video if you did. Consider subscribing for more Tesla content and I will see you guys in the next episode. Have a great day.